should be put first place. The Holy Spirit should be allowed to express himself in church. We should not box him in. We should not put a timer on him. And ding, when the alarm goes off, it's like, sorry, Holy Ghost, go back in the box. We feel like he should, you know, Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Amen. So we believe that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, his gifts will manifest. And so that is our typical church flow here uh, at Awakening House of Prayer. We make room for him. We lay hands on people. We believe in speaking in other tongues. How many of y'all speak in, in other tongues? Amen. Most of you, the rest of you, uh, we'll just uh, do some hands and feet ministry on you later. Get you filled and ready to run. I'm not going to talk for a long time because tonight I want it to be uh, just as much or more uh, about impartation for you. You know, many of you came hungry. You came hungry. Did anybody come that's not hungry? Because I'm going to ask you to leave. You know, Jesus, those who had unbelief, he put them out. There was a, there was a dead woman. They said, ah, she's dead. He's like, no, she's just like, nah, she's dead. And he made them get out. So did Peter. So if you're not hungry, here's the rules. We only have three rules. If you're not hungry, if you've got a Jezebel spirit... Or if you've got a religious spirit, you gotta go. You gotta repent, but you gotta go. And I'm kind of testing it right now. Some of you look at me like, okay, I can see that religious spirit on you. You can stay a little while longer, maybe it'll fall off. Some of y'all like, I don't know what I just got myself into. That's all right, put your seatbelt on. We're going for a ride. Amen. Hallelujah. So I want to share with you the, the word of the Lord, and I've really there's 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 three words that the Lord gave me. There's three words that he gave me. And I'm going to read them to you. I'm going to talk a little bit about them. And then we're going to go back into this prayer. So you need to be prepared. You need to hear what the Lord is saying. Now, the Lord has probably spoken. How many of you, the Lord has given you a personal word spoken to you in a still small voice for your life this year? See, just a relative handful, comparatively. And so that's, that's, the, and that's okay. There's no shame in that. There's, no, there's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with you. See, the enemy wants to make sometimes make you feel like, well, I can't hear from God. You know, one time a, a young woman who I was mentoring, she kept she came to me. She said, well, I can't hear from God. I can't hear from God. I can't hear from God. And so I would I would explain to her, you know, how, you know my sheep know my voice. The voice of another will not follow. You can hear from God. You know, you know, just quiet your soul. And I was teaching and equipping her. She came back to me one day and she said, the devil told me I can't hear from God. And so I said. Hold on a second. So, so you're hearing in the spirit just fine. Just change the channel. Just switch the dial. See, we don't have any trouble at all hearing from the devil, do we? Sometimes we think it's us. But you know, some of you know, you know that you know when you hear that, you know, you know you're never going to be. You know that's not you. Sometimes it seems harder to hear from God, and so we do need prophets. In the body of Christ. Amen. To equip believers Amen. to hear from the Lord. But also to share what the Lord is saying. At a corporate level. This word. If you'll accept it tonight. Will start in your life. Or I should say. Accelerate in your life. A process that's already underway. How many of you could use an acceleration? Amen. 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 Let me pray. Father I thank you for the anointing of the spirit of God. I thank you Lord for your spirit. That dwells here in this place. God, help me to articulate, navigate the word that you've shared with my heart to share with your people. Help me, Lord, to expound on the points that need to be expounded upon and to, to be concise and accurate in your spirit. Lord, give your people ears to hear what your spirit is saying and to apply it to their life in a way that's meaningful and unique to them. Help us, God, to stay on one accord. I break and bind all distractions, all spirits of offense, all spirits of, well, whatever spirit's not of you that, that comes to steal from us, God, we break and bind it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. The key word is metamorphosis. That's the first word. I was in, I was taping the Jim Baker show in Missouri, or as they used to say, Missouri. Missouri, 
And I was there, and they had condos there on the compl on the uh, comp in the complex. And I, I got up, I took a shower, and I was sitting on the couch. And I heard the Lord say, a metamorphosis is underway. And he said to me, you've gone through a metamorphosis. Now, it had been an extremely rough year, really more than a year. Really, really rough. But let me tell you something tonight. There's a reason for your struggle. Yes, absolutely. Be encouraged. There's a reason for your struggle. Metamorphosis. Metamorphosis. You know that when a butterfly, when a, when, a, when a caterpillar is born, it eats and it eats and it eats. And then at some stage when it's fully grown, it goes into what's called a chrysalis. And in this chrysalis, it almost becomes hidden from the world. You, you wouldn't know there was even anything inside. It's motionless. It's still. It just hangs there. Some of you have felt like God has just put you on hold, put your life on pause. You're just, you're just, you're in a drawer or you're on a shelf. You wonder, does God even notice that I'm here anymore? Does he even hear my prayers? There's something called a dark night of the soul. Where you go through such trials where you, you can't seem to hear God's voice. You, you can't seem to remember the right word, the right scripture. And you've got Job's friends all around you that want to tell you that you've sinned, what you've done wrong. da 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 if any of Job's friends are here, please exit stage left. I don't like Job's friends. They're mean. A metamorphosis is underway. And I almost, I texted Prophet Vanessa and I said, man, the Lord told me, he said, a metamorphosis is underway. I've just gone through a metamorphosis and I was going to do a, a Facebook Live on it right then because I was so fired up by the word. This was last July. But I knew that it was to incubate. I knew that it was to, to, to roll over my spirit. I knew that it wasn't time. And see, part of maturing in the prophetic is knowing when it's time to release a word and when it's time to pray, to pray it through. Many people ask me, how do I know when, when I'm supposed to, you know, if am I supposed to release this prophecy? Am I not supposed to release this prophecy? I always say that the same Holy Spirit that gave you the prophecy will tell you when to release it. Seriously, he'll let you know, you'll know. And I knew that it wasn't time, and I sat on it, and I sat on it, and I sat on it. And around October, I realized this was what the Lord was saying over the body of Christ. One of the things, he's saying many things for 2018. A metamorphosis is underway. That is a radical change. Becoming a new creature in Christ. Some of you, you just need to hit the reset button. Some of you just need a do-over. I don't know how old you are, you know, how young you are, what stage of life you're in. Some of you just need a, just a new life. Thank God the Bible speaks of newness of life. We are new creatures in him, and we can have second chances, third chances. Thank God this is my third big chance in life. I've started my life over now for the third time. I've dealt with tragedies. I've dealt with triumph. I've dealt with the good times, and I've dealt with the bad times. And I've, I've restarted my life now just recently for the third time. You can do that. The change I've promised. First, little by little, and then an outward manifestation of an inner working I've been doing in my people. How many of you, you've got, you've got a promise from God over your life? A prophecy, a scripture you stand on. Listen, let me encourage you tonight. I really want this message to encourage you. God is faithful. He's going to bring the promises to pass. Amen. The prophetic words, unless you're just working against him, if you, if you're, if you have any, uh, uh, if you're determined, you have any determination in you at all, if, if you're serious, and I know that you are, you would not be here on a Friday night. You know where the world is right now? Well, they ain't even in the club yet because it's too early. <laughs> They're having a few pre-club drinks, if you know what I'm saying. You don't, you know, if you show up to the club before 12 o'clock, you know, you just... <laughs> no clubs. No clubs. No clubs, praying John. God's going to bring the change. God's going to bring the promise. Sometimes the reason why you haven't seen the promise yet is because God's got to change you on the inside. And it's not any fun. I hate change. It's not any fun at all. It's no fun. Who likes change? You? Three people have devils. I'm kidding. Some people do. They thrive in change. Some people really do. They love change. 
Me, not so much, but I live in change. I live in mass change all the time. A metamorphosis is underway. I will bring the change I've promised first, little by little. How did Israel evict its enemies from the promised land? The Bible said little by little. And then the outward manifestation of an inner working I've been doing in my people. That metamorphosis, listen, that metamorphosis will spill out from the spirits of my people into the spheres they influence in the seven mountains. Now let me say this. Guess what? In case you did not know this, you have influence. Yes. Every single one of you has authority and influence. And might I add, you have favor. Yes. All of you. I'm looking at a bunch of people who are influential, highly favored of the Lord, and carry the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are unstoppable, ma'am. You're unstoppable. Whatever tried to stop you is going to have to bow in the name of the Lord. It's going to have to because you've got influence. You influence the world around you more than you know. More than you know. The tra who's a business leader? Anybody in the business realm? You own a business? Cecil? A few of you. John, don't be, don't be, don't be trying to hide from me. Listen. This is, this, is, this is the word of the Lord for you. Transformed business leaders will see their companies as ministry hubs. When this metamorphosis takes place in your heart, you know, I had somebody message me this morning, somebody that's also aligned with Chuck Pierce. And they messaged me, I, I woke up, I saw it, and they said, you know, 25 years ago, I made Jesus the CEO of my But are you really letting him in on your decisions? He said, 25 years ago, I made Jesus the CEO of my company. And he said, I, I was having a hard time, but it totally turned my, my business around. He's got intercessors, prophetic intercessors on staff. Not awesome. You need to get some of those. You got, you got one. Wow. Amen. Transform. We'll see their ministry, the companies as ministry hubs. Do you know that, that as a business leader, that you come across so many people a day? You don't have to be congregations. This is the kind of metamorphosis the Lord wants us to, to, to embrace, that whatever mountain of, uh, 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 the sphere of influence, that this, one of the seven mountains, whatever one we're in, that we will begin to, to see it as, a, as an area to, of transformation in the society. Amen. We're going to turn this around together. We, have to, we all have a part. Transform cities, we'll see mass salvations. He says, listen, I'm calling those who have struggled in past seasons to make one more push because that last push will birth something in you and through you like the world has never seen and like nothing you can even imagine. Does anybody believe that? Yes. Do you know that there's greatness in you? That's right. That your desire to be great, your desire to leave a legacy, your desire to accomplish big things. Did you know that that's because you've got a big God on the inside of you? Yes. There's nothing wrong with having holy ambition. The religious system wants to tell you, well, you should be poor and you should be sick and you should be, don't ever do anything for yourself. No, we should want to do. The body. Jesus said, greater works than these will you do because I go to the Father. God has greater things for you to do than what you're doing right now for his glory. Amen. It's all about bringing him glory. Do you think us being poor brings him glory? Sick brings him glory? Distraught our emotions brings him glory? No. The Lord wants to change us from the inside out. Make one more push. <laughs> Jesus, 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 I feel the Holy Spirit. Lord says, I have allowed you to go through struggles and through suffering so that I could use you as a compassionate change agent in the earth. 
you have authority, you have influence, you have power, you have an anointing, says the Lord. I intend to use you to comfort those who face disaster and to strengthen the weak. I intend to use you to lift others up, even those who dragged you down. Now, something very strange happened this week. I mentioned it on my, anybody on my morning prayer broadcast? Good number of you. Amen. Something strange happened about two years ago, almost two years ago to the day. There was a man in this region who somehow took some kind of offense toward me. From what I don't know, I didn't really know him from Adam. But he took some kind of offense for me. But more importantly, he took on some other pastor's offense. This other pastor had been uh, sanctioning immorality, sexual immorality in his church. And I used to serve in that church, and I mentioned to the pastor, look, this is not good. You can't have sexual morality on the worship team. And it was not just any kind of sexual morality. It was the abomination kind of sexual morality, if you follow what I'm saying. And I said, Pastor, you, you can't have this on your worship team. The Lord will not bless this. And he would not listen. He became angry. And me and another pastor that were there tried to reason with him. We pled with him. I wrote him a 10-page letter pleading with him. Please, please. I know you want to build your church. And I know that this is good worship. But it's not worth it. Well, I left. He accused me of stealing all the church's equipment, which it was actually my equipment. It was my computer. It was a small church. They didn't have much. But he spread all over town that I stole it, which was... You know, fine and dandy. I mean, if he really thought I stole it, he would have called the police, right? Yeah. And then hooked up with a, another man um, who had taken some other kind of offense with me for some reason. Uh, and this man took on the young pastor's offense and began contacting Charisma Magazine, whom I worked for at the time. Told them I was a Jezebel, that I was tearing down churches bit by bit, splitting churches, everyone I walked into. Uh, began to contact the healing rooms ministers in the region, uh, the head of the healing rooms, and began to tell them that I had a Jezebel spirit and was warning them to stay away from me. Uh, contacted uh, my spiritual father, uh, contacted uh, some other people in the area, started to send people into my church uh, to, to, to sort of spy things out and came back and uh, began spreading very, very nasty rumors about me. Uh, which really caused a setback in our church for a while because people did not know what to believe. And we've only now begun to recover from that because it was so vicious. And, and, and actually one time sent, sent, claimed um, that, that, that uh, a woman called her, another leader in the region had been to my church and had had an ungodly encounter with me, that I had ripped her up one side and down the other. And it turns out I was not even in the church that day I was traveling. And so it was a blatant lie. And so this happened, and it was, it was a really bad trial because it was, you know, just all these rumors just spreading. You know, what, have you ever had that happen to you before? Gossip, slander? And, and, you know, my spiritual father rebuked him and said, look, I know this woman of God. I've known her for many years. You need to come, and we need to have a meeting, and you need to say all this in front of her. Because I was just getting the emails other people were sending. He refused to meet. The head of the healing rooms ministry rebuked him and said, we've known her. She's a daughter. We've known her for many years. She walks in integrity. This is, these, are, these are lies. You need to come and have a meeting. We need to sit down and talk. He would not do it. Another pastor who's extremely influential in the region. If I called his name, you'd know him. He's extremely, extremely influential in the reason, region. I went and met with him, and he said, he said, let me call him. He called him. He said, you need to stop this. You need to put a stop to it. And he just would not stop. And so, you know, what can you do at that point? I contacted some of the generals in the body of Christ who advised me. One said, get an attorney. He's slandering you. I was given different pieces of advice. Yeah. Well, yesterday, I got a, a letter, like a two-page letter from this man. And he said, uh, essentially, um, Happy New Year to you. I am so sorry that I caused you all of this grief. I was way out of order. Several people tried to get me to sit down with you, and I refused. And I'm willing to make this up to you in any way that you decide. And I learned a big lesson, and I'm sorry that it was at your expense. You know what that's called? 
vindication. You ought to try entering into it. It feels pretty good. Amen? <laughs> but you can't vindicate yourself. But that came from keeping a right heart, forgiving, not trying to take vengeance in my own hands. I could have just blown him right wide open. I could have revealed things to him, about him in the region. I could have swapped railing for railing and made stuff up like he did with me. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. I intend to use you to lift others up, even those who dragged you down. Now, I've not replied to him yet because I want to be thoughtful of my reply. He can't make it up to me. He can't. And the ones that hurt you and abused you and gossip about you and lie to you and put a lid on you and set you back and stole from you and, and, and spitefully used you, they can't pay you back either. But guess what? Hey! God can. It's called a mega payback. All the suffering. He saw it. God saw it. There's a reason for the suffering. Your matter shall be greater than your past. God has something far above and beyond anything you could ask, think, or imagine. He's no respecter of persons. I've been through hell and back a number of times. God always brings me through the hell. And if you're in the middle of hell, don't camp there whining, complaining, groaning. I break the assignment of gossip over your lives. I break every enemy assignment to slander you. I break every enemy assignment to bring cycles of abuse in your life. I break the cycles of abuse in your life right now. In Jesus' name, I call it finished. I say this assignment, this strategy from hell, it's over. We say it's canceled. We say it's done. We say it's finished. We say it's time to move forward in Jesus' name. We say vindication belongs to us. Yeah, vengeance belongs to the Lord, but vindication is our portion. I thank you, Lord, that you will prepare a table for us in the presence of our enemies. In Jesus' name, Lord, we forgive those who wronged us. We forgive those who maligned us. We forgive them, God, Father, forgive them. We ask you to forgive them, God, and show mercy upon them, Lord, for your son's sake. I thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, I got the authority on this one. Vindication's coming to you both too. Like a rapid vindication. Some of you suffer beyond your limit because you were trying to be honorable. You tried to do the right thing to the point that it almost destroyed you. You thought if I just stick it out a little longer, they'll do right by me, they'll change. Something will shift. This will be mended. This will be restored. This will be renewed. It's time to move forward. Like the woman of God's shirt prophesies to us, it's time to. I might have to get me a shirt like that, woman of God. I might have to trade you because I like it. Lord says, You've been changed and are changing from glory to glory. The glory that rested upon you during the struggle is increasing as you step into the assignment I am giving you to see transformation all around you. See, some of you need transformations in your family, yes. in your marriage, yes. in your business, in your whatever area that you need transformation for. And we're believing for it tonight. But see, it starts right here. Yes. Or as you say, right here. Yes. In your spirit. All change begins in your spirit. It starts here, and it works its way outward. I see uh, the glory of the Lord that rests upon you in your struggle. You carry the kingdom. Releasing the kingdom into atmospheres around Release the kingdom into atmospheres around you. And watch the darkness flee as the brilliance of my love works through you by faith. Isn't that poetic? Yes. 
I'm not a poet, but the Lord is. Amen. Yeah. Have a confidence that I have called you. I have equipped you. And I am sending you. And that I am always with you. See, we need to have confidence in God. God has your back. He has your back. He's on your side. If God is for us, who can be against us, woman of God? And let me just, let me just, let me just, let me just, let me put it this way. What does it really matter who's against us when God is for us? It might be a setback, but you know, even through that setback in the ministry here, because this man of God slander, you know what? I learned, I grew, I learned how to persevere. Many times I wanted to shut this place down. Can't tell you how many times I wanted to shut it down. And now we're going to be among the apostolic churches in the region that help to bring transformation. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. It's not all about the four walls of the church. There's a city out there with prostitutes, drug addicts, gamblers that need deliverance. And this 10 ways to be a happier Christian thing ain't going to cut it. I'm all, I think being happy is good. But I got a one-step program for being happy. Amen. Jesus. I got a one-step program for drug addicts. Jesus. Yeah, it might be a process. I understand there's a process, but it starts right there with Jesus. Every other step is inconsequential. Jesus is the main step. Amen. I see widespread metamorphosis. I see metamorphosis in people, in companies, in churches, and in societies. The metamorphosis is coming out of an intense struggle in the hearts and minds of people. Yeah. What even showed me the metamorphosis is coming out of church splits and, 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 and moral failures in leadership. In other words, God is about to restore. Amen. Because those who fell into sin, dear God, he can restore them. I was talking with a man of God today who was a, a megachurch pastor in the 80s. And then he fell. It was a very public moral failure. But you know what? God restored him. Amen. Amen. God restored him. God is a God of restoration. It's coming from a changing of the guard in cities, states, and nations. Many will come to realize the reality of Genesis 50 and 20. Genesis 50 and 20 says, What the enemy meant for harm, God meant for good. Amen. That's one of my favorite scriptures. In Romans 8 and 28, God works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to, to his purpose. But here's the thing, guys. We must submit to the process. Yes. Now, the Holy Spirit is the change agent in your life. He is the one who brings the change. It is his spirit on the inside of you that is, that is, that is causing this. And here's the thing, too. We have to understand that there, 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 there's, there's, there's pressure in the metamorphosis. And sometimes we have to, to, to discern, we always have to discern, but, but sometimes we feel uh, the pressure from everywhere. Yeah. And you've got to discern, is it the Lord yeah. or is it the devil? Yeah. Because, you know, the Bible says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee. Yeah. But sometimes we, we get it backwards. Yeah. We submit ourselves to the devil, we resist God. Yeah. Did I just say that? Yeah. Yeah. None of you, of course. <laughs> just the ones at the club. <laughs> now let me talk to you about this next part that I have not released this anywhere publicly at all I'm saving it for tonight a spirit of innovation is coming back to the church hey. yes. you know have you, have you noticed that the church is not every church but the church at large a little crusty yes, Come on yes, yes I agree a little religious yeah you know, it's okay to wear jeans in church. I, there's nothing wrong with dressing up either. I'm not, I'm not against, you know, people coming. Our, our, our worship leader, Tyson, comes in like a sharp-dressed man every Sunday. <laughs> Suit and tie, looking like a... There's nothing wrong with that until you make a law out of it. That's right. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Until you have a dress code in church to where the unbelievers who just get saved, they stumble in the church, they don't feel comfortable. Because you've got like, you know, all these, they don't, maybe they don't have no fancy clothes. Maybe they don't have any money to buy some fancy clothes. Looking good is good. You should look good. You should be presentable. But all this thing about, you know, it, 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 we're not reaching the lost. We're not reaching the world with our stodgy 1980s 
Fashion. So preachers never moved out of the 80s. Their fashion sense has not changed. It's not all about fashion. But what I'm saying is, you know, in this next great move of God, you know, it's the churches with an innovative spirit that are going to see the fruit and the increase because nobody wants to come, you know, to a stodgy religious... It's not about the word only. It's about the word and the spirit. Yes. Yes. Smith Wigglesworth prophesied. Smith Wigglesworth prophesied. You know who Smith Wigglesworth is? Yes. He prophesied that the, one of the last great moves of God would be a, a word and spirit movement. Hallelujah. We need the word of God. Yes. I go to some churches, they don't preach nothing. All they do is float around in the Holy Ghost. You can do that sometimes. Sometimes you'll have a service where you do that. Yes. But if you do that every week, week after week for 10, 12, 13 weeks, people are starving to death. Come on. Talk about it. And then other churches, they just preach the word, preach the word, preach the word, preach the word. And people don't have no fresh fire. They don't have no fresh anointing. They don't have a touch. Nobody's getting healed. Nobody had a prophetic word since three generations ago. <laughs> so we have these extremes. And I believe myself, I mean, you can argue this with me if you'd like to later. Don't shout me down while I'm preaching good. But I believe you need both. Amen. We need a demonstration of Holy Spirit power back in our churches again. And we need a solid word of God. We need both. We need both. But the spirit of, this, the spirit of innovation, uh, the world has morphed and is morphing in July 2017 Bloomberg declared that the world is about to change even faster. He said the pace of innovation and disruption is accelerating. Yes, yes. I mean, think about it, guys. Five years ago, we didn't have Uber. Now all you have to do is say, Alexa, call me an Uber. We didn't have Alexa. Eleven years ago, we didn't have iPhones. Now we can't, you know, I'm surprised that, you know, you've been very good. No one's staring at their phone, except Matthew. <laughs> Teasing you. We do, we do good not to have this thing in our face all the time. You know, 11 years ago, that wasn't so. Indeed, we're in an age of innovation and acceleration. Prophetically speaking, as part of this metamorphosis, I see a spirit of innovation coming to the church. I see innovations throughout the Bible in the form of inventions. Yep. The Lord is going to give, begin to give Christians witty inventions. Why should, you know, the, the greatest phones in the world be developed by Buddhists? That's right. You know, Steve Jobs was brilliant, but he was not a Christian. I still believe that, you know, he tapped into the creative power of God and the innovation of God to do that. How much more should we not be innovative? We should have innovative ways to, 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 to build new revenue streams. Yes. We don't need to depend on our job. That's we true. depend on God to give us creative ideas that we might not have just one stream of income, but two, three, four, five streams of income so that if one of them gets a little dry, one of them gets a little low, there's another stream right behind it. Innovation. Let that innovation fall upon us to God tonight. The Bible uh, tells us about uh, 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 inventions which are tied to God's wisdom. Proverbs 8, 8 and 12. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty inventions. See, it's in the Bible. The Bible speaks of Jubal, the first of those who played the harp and the flute. Genesis 4 and 21. He invented the harp and the flute. Somebody had to invent it. Somebody had to invent it. Zila, the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. He was the father of those who created these instruments. I mean, he created these, he's the father. Second Chronicles 26, 15 speaks of Uriah, who made, I like this now, who made engines of war invented by skillful men. Wow. Engines of war. Invented by skillful men. In modern times, many people, many inventors credit God with their with their inventions. Yes. If you go look at some of the greatest inventions ever created, they they, they credit God. George Washington Carver yes. found 350 uses for the peanut. Yes. Yes. He made makeup out of peanuts. 
Now today everybody's allergic to peanuts. I guess that wouldn't work so well. <laughs> he said, the Lord has guided me, and without my Savior, I am nothing. Mary Hunter is an award-winning chef. She insists all her recipes come from heaven. We need to, listen, we need to tap into the Spirit of God in our daily lives for witty inventions, for whatever field you work in. You have an edge in the marketplace. You have an edge. It's called the Spirit of God. She said, I don't have a cookbook. God gives me my own. Prayer is where I get 99% of my recipes. Amen. Gary Starkweather was an engineer who invented the laser printer. He said, I believe that to a great extent, the creativity we possess is because the Creator, capital C, put it there. God put things in us as tool developers and creative individuals, and I think it has to please Him when He sees us use those faculties to make something completely new. Yes. See, I agree with that. John 1 and 3 says, all, all things were created through Him, and without Him, nothing was created. And you have a creative spirit. You have an innovative spirit. Why? The spirit of the living God dwells on the inside of you. The spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells on the inside of you. Therefore, you are creative. Yes. Amen. And there's no reason in the world why you cannot ask the Lord, Lord, help me tap into the spirit of innovation. Help me to find an innovative way to do my job. You don't have to depend just on your, your good looks and your natural skills. You got the Holy Ghost. Amen. You got the Holy Ghost. You don't. Have, you, you've got an edge. You've got an edge. Somebody don't believe me. I believe you. Amen. Amen. The church has been lagging on the innovation front. Religion has offered us a form of godliness without its power. Yes. It's not going to get people saved. The kingdom of God is not in word only, but in power. Muslims are not going to get saved by John 3.16. That's right. I'm sorry. John 3.16 is an awesome verse. But that's not enough. God himself loves the Muslim people so much that he's giving them dreams and visions of Jesus. That's power. The Lord wants to bring a metamorphosis to the church so that's innovation driven. Even in our outreaches. We have a, a, a 420 fire hub here. And, and we send out evangelists out on the streets, and they're demonstrating the power of God, Amen. seeing people healed. Yes. You know, somebody doesn't believe in Jesus, but all of a sudden, they, they, you know, they, they rip the cast off their leg that was broken, and they're walking. Come on. They're a little more open to the gospel. Amen. Amen. The spirit of innovation coming to the church. <laughs> and then the third thing is an accelerated acceleration. Part of this metamorphosis, which will begin even now and continue in the years ahead, we'll see an accelerated acceleration. I was... At the Apostolic Council of Prophetic Elders, it was my first year being invited. It was in Dallas uh, with Cindy Jacobs and um, uh, Bishop Bill Hammond and James Gall and others. And, uh, and they, were, they were playing music and prophesying. And I, I got the mic and I prophesied these three words. I had known the metamorphosis. I didn't have the spirit of innovation yet. I didn't have the accelerated acceleration yet. But this is profound. Accelerate means to move faster, to gain speed, to progress, to progress from grade to grade more rapidly than usual, to bring about at an earlier time, to cause to move faster, to hasten the progress of development, according to the dictionary. It also means a change in velocity, a change in velocity. We're about to see those who accept their God-given callings and embrace metamorphosis move faster, gain speed, progress more rapidly, and step into new anointings at a younger age. Millennials. Do we have any millennials here? Just a few. Let me tell you what God showed me. Millennials are poised for a rapid rise. Part of this prophesied acceleration is pressing into the spirit of innovation and creativity. The two are tied together. Things that past generations took 20 years to do, you're going to rise up in less than half the time. Come on. Yeah. Why? Because the days are short. Yeah. So I, I want to be surrounded by millennials. I love the millennial generation. Yeah. My daughter is a millennial. Why? Because they're innovative. Amen. They're creative. Yes. They're not stodgy yes. and religious for Come the on. most part. That's <laughs> while I went into one that is. But I believe in the millennials. I believe that the millennials 
have a key to the next great awakening. Amen. Amen. And I believe if we don't, if the church does not begin to allow the millennials to move into the gifts of God. Come on, talk about it. Those churches that will not allow the millennials a room, a yeah. place, yeah, yeah, to yeah. express themselves. Come on. They're just going to. Come on now. And I'm not cursing anybody. I'm saying we must pass the torch. Yes. There's a season by which we run alongside one another. I, you know, I'm running alongside Pastor Austin and Pastor Sierra. They're not taking the torch yet. There's a season where you run alongside. Yes. And then there's a season where you pass the torch. But while you're running alongside, you got to let them do the stuff. Yes. Yes. And so if you've got millennial children, begin to prophesy life over them. Begin to prophesy innovation. How many of you have millennial children? Look at that. I know sometimes they act goofy. <laughs> Let's just say that it's innovative. <laughs> I know sometimes it may, may make you want to just, you know, pull your hair out. Let's just say that, that that's just a prophetic edge. <laughs> Let's begin to speak over the next generation. Amen. What God is saying. At the same time, the older generation... God is going to make up for lost time and fulfill Joel 2 and 25 through 32. So I will restore to you as you embrace the spirit of innovation. So I will restore to you the years that the sw swarming locust has eaten. The crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust. My great army which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of your Lord, Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be put to shame. Amen. So if you're a part of the older generation, like the baby boomer generation, if you'll embrace this spirit of innovation, it will like take years off your life. Come on. In other words, God is going to make up for lost time, even mistakes. Amen. So you see, I don't know, you almost all be Gen Xers because you got like, y'all looking at me like, what about me? <laughs> I ain't old and I ain't young. I'm stuck in the middle somewhere. <laughs> Hallelujah. The struggle of metamorphosis at an individual level is not always a physical one. Many times it's a challenge to embrace something new. The new wine skin for the new wine God wants to pour and release through you. Sometimes the struggle, the suffering is a pruning away of relationships. Mm. There's somebody here that you've just seen the loss or even the death of, I don't mean a physical death, the loss of a relationship that meant a lot to you. But the Lord is saying, the Lord is saying that I allowed it because you can't go where I need to take you. It was, it was, you didn't see it at the time. You might not see it now, even still. But it was a, it was a codependency that was forming. It was a, it was a wrong soul tie. It was, it was holding you down. It was, it was one of those heavy weights that Hebrews talks about. Yes. The Lord says, I'm bringing healthy relationships. I'm bringing Hallelujah. new friendships. I'm bringing those who will actually stand with you, walk with you. Instead of actually standing against you and talking about you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I want to pray for that in just a minute. That's, that's heavy on my heart <clears throat> right now. I think there's a lot of you that are in that situation. Others of you are dealing with relationships that are just changing. They, they've not died. Or it shows me they've not died. They're not dead. You've not lost them. But they're different than they used to be. And that sort of grieves you. Because you wanted it to stay the same and you thought it would always be the same. But there are some relationships in life that they do stay the same for the long haul. And there's others that they shift. You're maybe not as close. Maybe, maybe there's a distance that's, that's come. But the Lord says, I have a purpose in all of these things. And you trust me. I'm believing for that as individual believers undergo metamorphosis and the church uh, embraces the spirit of innovation, we're going to see a lot of damage to the kingdom of darkness. Mm -hmm. But make no mistake, as we begin to uh, 
embrace this, we have to also understand that there's a demonic metamorphosis, a counterfeit metamorphosis. The enemy is also at work. And don't be fooled because God is bringing great change into your life, but the enemy will try to come with something tempting, something shiny, a calling that is not really a God calling. So we must be wise. We must be discerning. But I look at in this congregation tonight, and I see a bunch of people that are that are hungry for something new, that are hungry for change, that are desperate for 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 some kind of break in life. And I just say over you right now that your that that one more push. I just about broke out in prophecy earlier when I read that to make one more push. See, some of you, the enemy wants you to think that it's so hard. The enemy wants you to think that you're so far away from the finish line. That things are never going to change. That you've pushed as hard as you can push. You, 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 you've only, even Some of you have even tried to force things open. But the Lord is saying, just one more push. Just one more push. Just one more push, just one more push, and you're going to birth something that's greater than you could ever imagine. And the Lord would say to you, why is it that you think that you're being resisted at the level that you've been resisted? Why do you think people who should have stood with you walked away from you? Why do you think you've been attacked at the right and at the left and from the front and from behind? Why do you think that is, says the Lord? Could it be possible, says the Lord, that I am bringing you into a, a greater level of my anointing and the enemy hates what he sees happening in your life? Could it be possible that those around and about you that should have stood with you were actually uh, standing against you and you did not know it? And that I removed them to clear the path for those who are coming after them who will lift you up where others have torn you down. Could it be possible, asked the Lord? Could it be possible that I have something greater for you than you would ever even think to ask for? Could it be possible to ask the Lord that if you press into my heart, if you press into the change, and if you stop looking backwards and thinking about yesterday and yesteryear, that if you keep your mind focused on me, could it be possible that I could do such a rapid work in your life that this time next year you won't even remember what it used to be like? Hey, shorakata lokoto, yes. Oh, that's a good word. That's a good word. Let's say we all meet here this time next year and give some testimonies. Of course, they ain't going to take that long. Hallelujah. I want to pray for you in just a moment. I want to pray. I want to pray for those who have had uh, 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 losses of relationship. I want to pray for those who are in the middle of transition and they're just you just don't feel like you can push one more time. I want to pray for those who need prayer for anything. I want to impart some things to you. I don't want to leave anybody out. I don't want to leave anybody out. If you came here tonight hungry, let me just tell you something. Let me just decree and declare something to you. What you came expecting, you will receive. Yeah. Because the Bible says that your expectation shall not be cut off. Is that what it says? So if you come in faith, believing, you'll receive. You'll receive. Some of you need new strength. Some of you need a healing in your body. There's all kinds of things. I want to give you an opportunity to give, though. I want to remind you that we are, we are, uh, we are in a, a new year. And some of you need a metamorphosis in your finances. Some of you need a, 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 a change, a shift in your finances. Some of you, the Lord has, has told, has given you a strategy. Some of you need to press in for a strategy. What I know is if you want to see something, listen, if you want to see something different in your finances, you have to do something different with your finances. Sometimes we're just poor stewards. Sometimes we just blow our money. And we can't blame God at the end of the month when we don't have enough. Some of us, you've been really good stewards, but you've sustained a massive attack from the enemy. Everything that could have gone wrong went wrong. There's all kinds of Things that happen in the financial realm. But I'm believing for metamorphosis in finances. Amen? Yeah. 
So I'm not going to labor this. I'm not going to press this. I'm not going to give you John 638 tell you that if you give $638 that you, your finances are going to break open. They're going to be shaken down, pressed together, and running over. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to say that the first five people to give $1,000 are going to receive a, a, a one-time, limited-time pass to ask God for anything they want, and they're going to get it in three days. I'm not going to do that because all that is bogus and all that is old school religious manipulation. But what I am going to do is I'm going to ask you to ask the Holy Spirit what you should give. And if you hear nothing, that's the devil because we're not ever to come before the Lord without an offering. And if you want a metamorphosis in your finances, you need to do something different than what you've already done. I've seen mega breakthroughs. You know, let me just tell you a real quick story before you make out your, your checks. We're going to hand out envelopes in a minute. I was in the business world for 25 years and built several small businesses. They weren't large businesses, but they were very profitable. So much so that I was able to buy a number of properties cash with the business finances. And there came a time where the Lord began to winnow away my clients. I had one that was like a $30,000 a year client that I'd had for like 14 years. It just went poof. I used to do a lot of work with Microsoft and Amazon and IBM and big, big contracts where I would literally make $1,000 an hour. Wow. Yeah. And all of a sudden, all that work just dried up. And when it happened, it, you know... It bothered me. I'm thinking, what am I doing something wrong? Is this an attack of the enemy? What's going on? And I would begin to get a lack mindset in the middle of that. When I would lose one of these big contracts, I would begin to, to fear lack. Because I had been, just some years earlier, when my daughter was two, on food stamps without any money, you know, didn't know where I was gonna pay, how I was gonna pay my bills. It was a very, diet. when you go through mass financial struggles like that, you yes. end up with a fear of lack. Yes. Because how many you know, it's not any fun to not know how you're going to pay your FPL. It's stressful. How many you know it's stressful when the IRS is calling you and sending letters saying, we're going to freeze your assets? It's very, very stressful. And so uh, just recently, uh, I had I'd basically done away with almost my entire business. I had a couple, two, three small businesses. And, I sh and a few years ago, I, I shifted out of all that to, to go to work basically full-time for Charisma Magazine. And I was the first female editor there at the magazine. And it was, a, it was a great honor and a privilege to break that glass ceiling for all the other ladies that had never been allowed to be. There's not a lot of uh, female in top positions in the media. And it was a great honor to do that. But I'd given up most of, most of my business to do that because I could not do justice to that role and still, you know, you know, have 15 other clients like I used to. And so it was a massive pay cut, but I believe that God would, 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 would provide. It was like a third of what I would normally make in the world, but it was a labor of love. And then at, at some point about, about, about a year ago, the Lord began to, to, to lift the grace off of that assignment. And I just began to, to not enjoy it anymore. But the problem was, is that I had done away with all of my other clients. I had let all these other business relationships, except like one or two small ones, just fade away. I hadn't pursued as a freelance writer, you would pump and push and press. You never turn down anything. Anything anybody would pay for, you do it. You just keep stacking it up. You just take it. I'd given all that up. And then the Lord began to speak to me about going into full-time ministry. And I tell you what, fear of lack hit my mind. Because I already wasn't making what I was making before. Now what am I going to make? How am I going to pay the bills? And so this fear of lack that I used to struggle with, and it took me months and months and months and months to be willing to let that go. But let me tell you what happened when I sowed that. See, some of you need to not just sow money, but sow, sow things the Lord's telling you to let go of. And I began to, to let go of that, and, and it, was a, it was a very difficult uh, transition, and I also felt responsible to let them down. But let me tell you something. God has prospered me. 
People just send me checks in the mail sometimes randomly. You know, Reese, How Reese Howells was an intercessor in the uh, Welsh revival, and and he, the Lord told him to quit his job, and he depended on people he didn't even know where the money was going to come from. And so when I stepped out from Charisma, I didn't really know where the money was. And I had savings. I'm not, you know, but I didn't really know where the money was going to come from. And sure enough, in, in the middle of that church, people just started sending. I didn't even know from nowhere. Just started sending money. But you know what? I showed my life into the gospel. And some of you, listen to me tonight, if you'll just sow your whole life, it's not about even what's in your pocket. We need to sow financially. But if you'll sow your life, just surrender everything to him and be willing to let him do with your life what he wants, you won't have a money problem. You won't have a money problem. So ask the Holy Spirit what he would, he would have you to give. And as you sow your seed tonight, I want to challenge you. Say, Lord, I'm not just sowing the seed. I'm sowing my whole life. Because I'm going to see a metamorphosis. I'm adopting a spirit of innovation. And I'm going to see an acceleration. So if you need an envelope for your giving, raise your hand. And ask the Holy Spirit what he would have you to give. check you can make it to a hop if you're using a credit card it's really easy just stick your credit card in the envelope we'll pray about what you should give hallelujah if you're online and you want to sow a seed go to paypal.me slash awakening hop paypal.me slash Awakening Hop. If you're watching on A Hop TV, there is a button that says give or donate or something of the like. You're smart, you'll figure it out. Go sow a seed and sow your life. I'm telling you, I really feel an unction of the Holy Spirit that those who will truly surrender tonight, despite the persecution, despite what mom and dad say, you're going to see. You're going to see a rapid. God, the love that's in our hearts, Lord God, as we give the gifts that you've told us to give tonight, Father God. And we believe, Father, in our heart what you have promised tonight, Father God, that this change, this metamorphosis, 
this breakthrough, the promise of a new year, Lord God, in you is going to come upon us, Father God. And we just thank you for that now. We give you praise and glory and honor. We thank you, Lord God, that you make us willing to be able to change, to be able to fit into the plan that you have for us, Lord God, so that we can bring glory and honor to your name. And Father, we just thank you. I pray your blessings upon everyone in this in this room, Lord God, and everyone that's connected to these families here today. Lord, I pray that your blessings be upon them, that you would multiply the seed sown tonight, Father God, that you would increase it back to them, Father, a hundredfold, Lord God, greater and bigger and better than what they could ever think or imagine. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Bring your comment, bring your gifts. Do it as unto the Lord. Let him see how much you love him. creatives, those of you who work in a creative industry, and you may have been here when I've done this before, but I had a real strong unction, that, that spirit of innovation, if you are in a creative and graphic design, writing, filmmaking, fashion, if you're in some kind of creative industry, <laughs> come forward, she's happy, you're happy, why are you so happy, you're just happy? Hallelujah. Hey! Hey! Twins. Twins. Amen. I'm going to pray for you. And then I want each one of you to say a short declaration over the rest of them that they would catch this spirit of creativity. Innovation. I mean quick, not five minutes. I just want to do this quickly. If you're caring, I'm going to pray for you. And I want you to say something encouraging. I'm taking a risk now. Don't get up there and preach. We'll cut the mic off. Amen. Sometimes you get people on the mic and they go wild. Say something encouraging. Release something encouraging. Amen. Father, I thank you for these ones that carry the spirit of innovation.